So, welcome back to International School History. Non-democratic states have been the norm for most of human history. But in the first half of the 20th century, a new form of modern authoritarian state emerged. Firstly, in Lenin's Russia, and soon after in Mussolini's Italy and in Hitler's Germany. In this lesson, I'm going to look at what made this new modern authoritarianism different to the kings and the queens and emperors that had come before. Authoritarian regimes have always been important. As political scientist Paul Brooker put it, non-democratic government, whether by elders, chiefs, monarchs, aristocrats, empires, military regimes or one-party states, well, these have been the norm for most of human history. But, and this is the important point, the traditional authoritarian regimes of elders, chiefs and monarchs are qualitatively not the same as the modern authoritarian regimes that emerged after the First World War. So what made these new authoritarian regimes modern? There are, I think, three important characteristics. Firstly, modern authoritarianism depends on a different type of legitimacy than traditional authoritarians' dependence on inheritance and bloodlines. Secondly, ideology is important in authoritarianism that is modern, especially so in totalitarian states like Lenin's Russia or Hitler's Germany. And finally, the modern authoritarian state employs a much more centralised social control over its citizens than was ever possible in the old traditional authoritarian regimes. Firstly, modern authoritarian states are consciously modern. They cannot rely upon the old forms of authority to justify their rule. Things like, God chose my family to rule, or um, you should obey us because you've always obeyed us. These justifications couldn't easily work for modern authoritarianism. Unlike hereditary absolute monarchs, such as the Tsar in Russia, the legitimacy of the Bolsheviks could not derive from rightful dynastic succession from father to son. I rule because my father ruled, because the Bolsheviks were revolutionary and new. Now, tradition is an enormously powerful emotional source of legitimation. Next time you meet the Queen of England, ask her to provide a rational justification for the job she does. It can't be done. The monarchy is simply part of the traditional fabric of the British state. Like Father Christmas and the Tooth Fairy, it exists because people believe in it and have done so for a very long time. So without tradition and bloodlines, how does authoritarianism justify its rule? This brings us to the second characteristic of modern authoritarianism, ideology. The second characteristic difference of modern authoritarianism is the importance of ideology. Now, as we've just seen, modern authoritarian states cannot claim a right to rule, legitimacy, through inheritance in a tradition, and neither can they claim legitimacy through popular consent. Authoritarianism is, by definition, not democratic. So this is why ideology is important. Ideology is a set of opinions or beliefs of a group of people, a world view, that informs how these people act. Ideology can therefore provide a justification for authoritarian rule and a rejection of democracy. Now, at the end of the First World War, three rival socio-economic and political models emerged. There was the capitalist liberal democracies of uh, Britain and France that had come from a century of democratic struggle, and these provided the sort of dominant model of nation-building in 1919. But this model was challenged ideologically from the extreme left by Bolshevik communism and from the extreme right by Italian fascism. Both rival ideologies rejected liberal democracy. It was one of their defining features. For the Bolshevik communists, led by Lenin, the idea of building socialism by winning votes in elections had been rejected a generation before in the debates with Bernstein and the reformist Social Democrats. Lenin argued that capitalism couldn't uh, be gradually transformed and that capitalists 
would not give up power without being forced to do so by the revolutionary actions and dictatorship of the proletariat. This was the ideological justification for communism. The communist authoritarian state would dictate the transformation of Russia on behalf of the working class. And allowing bourgeois democracy would only jeopardize this important project. Fascism, the authoritarianism that emerged on the ideological right, was equally dismissive of the ability of ordinary people to govern themselves through democracy. Fascism has a very pessimistic view of human nature that suggests individuals are weak, weak-minded, irrational, and only really motivated by their animal instincts and violent natures. For fascists, democracy inevitably results in weak, chaotic, indecisive government, because what people really need is the domination of a strong leader who can impose his will and the subordination of the individual to the community and the nation. In both the communist and fascist uh, variants then, the ideology dictates that the individual submits to the power of the state, which brings us on to the third characteristic of modern authoritarianism, the enhanced social control of the state over the individual. The third distinctly modern feature of 20th century authoritarianism involve the centralization and modernization of the mechanisms of state control. The old authoritarian regimes of hereditary monarchs had ruled over a largely illiterate rural peasantry. Control was easily exercised by local authority, reinforced through the power of a conservative church and guaranteed by national military force. In contrast, modern authoritarianism seeks to control a modern society. The ambition here is to rule over an industrial, urban, connected citizenship, requiring an increasingly sophisticated, integrated form of layered social control, both formal and informal. Now, as we've seen in another lesson, formal social control is concerned with the coercive power of the state. Modern authoritarianism developed new types of surveillance operations, secret police forces, concentration camps for political opponents, which were centrally organised to detect and crush all potential threats. Informal social control is concerned with sophisticated attempts to influence how people perceive the state. This might involve, for example, the use of the most sophisticated of modern communication technology to spread the ideological message of the regime. If the traditional authoritarian regimes had been bolstered by the church, modern authoritarianism required a secular equivalent in the state control of newspapers, radio and cinema. Informal social control is also important in helping us distinguish between mere authoritarian states and those with totalitarian ambition. Now, whereas all authoritarian states use coercive social control, it's only the most totalitarian that have the ambition to try to change the way people think in line with the ideological goals of the state. Through both formal and informal means, therefore, modern authoritarianism seeks to control the modern individual just like the medieval king sought to control the medieval peasant. As society changes, so do the mechanisms of control. So that's modern authoritarianism. It cannot depend on traditional authority, but rather it uses ideology and a complex centralized system of social control to achieve its authoritarian ambitions. Yeah.